I'm Katie Freyer. I'm an engineer and I love chemistry almost as much as physics. <laughs> I had the opportunity to sit down with Katie to discuss her experiences as a person with disabilities in STEM and her experiences in school, work, and life. I met Katie back in 2016 as she's a close friend of my oldest child and they attended college together. I grew up in DeWitt, Michigan. I was born with a disability called arthrogryposis, which basically means my muscles didn't form correctly around my joints. It's a little bit of muscle, a little bit of bone, I don't have full range of motion and I have what are called contractures. So my joints cannot straighten fully. It's not degenerative. It doesn't technically get worse, but it's really hard to build and maintain muscle without a lot of intentional work involved. Arthrogryposis is a condition characterized by multiple joint contractures present at birth. It is a rare condition that affects one or more joints in the body, causing limited movement. Its name is derived from Greek, arthro meaning joint and gryposis meaning hooking, so the curving of joints. The exact cause of arthrogryposis is often unknown, although it can be associated with genetic, environmental, or neurological factors. And did you know studies have found intelligence in children with arthrogryposis tends to be normal to above normal? I had my first surgery when I was in kindergarten. I had my last real surgery between freshman and sophomore year of high school. People see someone with a disability and assume that person has every disability. So I'm deaf, I'm blind, I can't talk, I can't walk, I can't move. I've never been able to walk. It's crazy. You wouldn't even know how many disabilities I have. I didn't even know how many disabilities I have until I talked to these people. <laughs> <laughs> so admit it, we all build stereotypes when we meet people. Katie's experiences with stereotypes should make us think twice before we jump to any conclusions about who a person is. Growing up, I went to DeWitt Public Schools, my undergrad. I went to Michigan State University, got my Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering. And then uh, last year, I earned my Master's in Mechanical Engineering from Purdue University. School is a hard time for kids with disabilities. You're in a world where you need things that are different than everyone else. Sometimes those things are hard to accept on a personal level of accepting that you're different because accepting you're different isn't, you're not, you're not just born okay with yourself all the time. So you have that inner peace and then you have the outer peace of everyone else making it harder because they're reminding you that you're different and that it's weird and you're not like them. So those pieces will always inherently make things challenging. In high school, my trach was still newer, and my lungs were a lot more sensitive than they are even now. A trach is a commonly used abbreviation for tracheotomy, which is a surgical procedure that involves creating an opening in the front of the neck into the trachea or the windpipe. This opening, called a stoma, allows direct access to the airway. A tube known as a tracheostomy tube or trach tube is inserted into the stoma to keep it open and facilitate breathing. So I couldn't be exposed to perfume or cologne or even some strong deodorants or fabric softeners without having an asthma attack. I was on my own for most of high school. I would start my class period by going to the teacher's room. I'd go in, have an asthma attack, leave, get the worksheets for the day, get the homework, and then go sit in the library and teach myself all through high school. The only classes I really got to go to were band because our marching band was a family. And so we just said, don't wear it. And it hurts Katie and they didn't wear it. It was great. <laughs> a lot of high school I had to teach myself there's challenges there. Um, it, would I go back and change them? Honestly, no, because going through school like I did, <laughs> it built character. <laughs> um, it, it, you learn different skills to help you along the way. Uh, you get tougher, you learn to think for yourself, you learn to be an advocate for yourself, but you also learn that sometimes things aren't gonna be perfect. And that's just part of life. The world will not be perfect in our lifetime, no matter how hard we work, because perfect for one person is never perfect for everyone. Yeah, I had to teach myself. Actually learning how to teach myself 
in high school, made college possible. Learning how to teach myself in high school makes my job easier every day because I can take a new topic and in four hours I can do a deep dive into it, figure out how it works and how physics and chemistry and biology and all of the different sciences overlap to create the phenomena we're seeing. Who knows if I'd be able to absorb information quite like that if I hadn't had to teach myself back in high school. At the end of the day, I, I do believe that everything happens for a reason. You have to take every experience with a grain of salt. Sometimes they do suck in the moment and it's hard and you feel like the world's coming down around you, but life's a roller coaster. And every time you go down, you gotta go back up. As an educator, I can tell you not all kids have the ability to teach themselves and learn as successfully as Katie. Katie's reflection on her experiences is important for schools to recognize they can do better and they need to do better. Everyone is allowed an equal education. I was really involved in a robotics club. Um, so we had earned awards at the state level and got to go to world several times. Um, I was a Girl Scout. I earned my bronze, silver, and gold award. I earned a Youth Advocate of the Year award from a youth therapy camp in East Lansing for some programming I put on in my hometown for other students with disabilities, as well as I was in the marching band, and we went to states every year there. When students tell me they don't know what they want to do or what they want to study, I always have them look back at what they were interested in as a child. Katie's reflection as to why she's an engineer is a great example of this. Going through life, I always had to adapt things for myself. So I was innovating from the time that I started doing things. So I, I guess you could say I've always been an engineer and I decided to study it so that I could use the skills I had developed to help other people so that the world would actually be designed for all of us. So my senior year of college, my apartment chair called me into his office and he sat me down. Well, I was already sitting, but he sat down across from me. <laughs> he said, you're an inspiration for trying, but you'll never actually be an engineer. Most people, you know, that would just destroy them. I think it did kind of throw me for a loop for a while, but you know, you just, Trying to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, rely on family and friends to help you do it when people are like that. But knowing your own value, knowing, you know what, no, <laughs> I am going to be an engineer. I might not be the, the cookie cutter engineer that you're picturing, but I know I have value. I know I can bring this to the workforce and just having that resolve, knowing the reason you're doing something, knowing that why, it really helps keep you moving forward. Okay, I'm going to say right now, that professor is a... Step one is never question someone's belonging. Everyone has a place where they are. Whether they had to earn their way there or they're there because it's public school and everyone's there, they're where they're supposed to be. Um, so take each student like they're a student because they are. <laughs> Number two, don't dump accessibility back on the student. Um, I think so many people think accommodations are each person's individual responsibility. I mean, would you send any student home with their work for the semester and say, go learn this because that's your job? No, because you're the teacher, you're the professor, that's why you're there. Likewise, if a student can't learn the same way, maybe how they learn will help someone else in the class too. Of course, there's 27 kids in the classroom and you can't always talk to each person on each on their level every second of every moment but as long as you make sure that no one is completely lost you're helping them move forward three accepting that things will never be perfect is a really good first step things will never be perfect there will always be hard challenges there will always be things to face and even if someone sees you putting in the effort, that goes such a long way. I had a chemistry lab 
and I was really lucky to have a really great lab team there. The professor that was in charge of the labs understood that sometimes I have chemical sensitivities, sometimes it's hard for me to interact with things, so he worked really hard to set me up on a GoPro in the lab. It was never a question of, can she do this? It was, how are we going to do this? And the professors that are like that made such a huge impact in the experience for students. Because when they don't question your belonging, you don't find yourself questioning it. I had this friend that's a really cool chemistry teacher. I, I think she might even be the best in the country. I don't know. Katie is talking about her close friend and my daughter, Robin, who is a chemistry teacher. And I'll agree with Katie, probably the best in the country. She had a student in her class who had a cochlear implant. Safety is super important, right? You never want to go in the lab without your proper PPE. And so this student could not be comfortable wearing goggles because the elastic band of the goggles hit the cochlear implant. For those of you who don't know what a cochlear implant is, it's actually implanted into your brain. It goes through your head. And so obviously any pressure on it would not be comfortable. Instead of just saying, okay, you have to wear it anyway, or okay, I guess you can't be in the lab, or okay, you just don't have to be safe. Uh, this amazing teacher went above and beyond and gave me a call and said, hey, can you help me out with this? And we set the student up with like a little 3D printed bridge piece that fit over the cochlear implant. So the goggle strap to fit as it was supposed to without applying pressure to the actual site of the implant. I designed and built the bridge. I built what I call a, a little lab tech center in my garage. Um, so I was able to work from home. I worked for an appliance company. So I had a actual dryer in my garage. I would order parts from our plant. They'd ship them to my house. They'd ship them to the tech center and my coworkers would drop them off. So every day I'm getting you know, crates and boxes of parts and putting together prototypes. I have some 3D printers set up out there. So I can pretty much do anything I need to do to make things look right from my house. My employer is incredible. I was in a new office space. The bathroom didn't really fit my chair, um, but it was legally compliant. I wasn't going to speak up because they really didn't have to do anything. My coworkers noticed me going across the parking lot to my old building every day at lunch to, and realized it was pretty regular on a schedule. And they're like, are you going over to use the bathroom? And I was like, maybe, why? <laughs> and they're like, why are you? And I'm like, well, my chair doesn't fit. And they're like, but we're compliant. And I'm like, yes, but that doesn't always mean it's perfect. And within two days, well, later that afternoon, they had the interior designer there. Within two days, they were starting construction to modify the bathroom closest to my desk and a second bathroom in the building. And they renovated a bathroom for me. Good job, Whirlpool. You're definitely a leading example to listening to the accessibility needs of your employees and not just leaving it at, we are compliant. I feel seen in the ways of the weird stairs, you know, the weird looks people give me, you know, you're going down the street and that mother pulls her child out of the way because even though you're still like 20 feet away, she thinks she's gonna run over them. Um, but then there are those other times where you're unseen, where you have to sit at the table, the waiter goes all the way around and then gets to you and looks at the person next to you. After that, you know, usually the assumption is I'm uneducated. I don't know what I'm talking about. I can't talk in general. No one wants to be ignored. And why do people do this? Well, I believe it's how children are raised and how they witness their own parents interact with others. Don't raise your kids to be afraid of or push to the outside people with disabilities. It is better to ask if you don't understand than to judge or ignore. The first step is getting someone to interact with me which is usually the first bigger barrier. Once I can get them to interact, usually pretty quickly I can break them in, either with a side-handed joke, calling them out for their ableism, or just a, you know, well-placed, yes, I know that you're talking to them, but hello, I'm the one with the credit card here, paying the bill. <laughs> you just deal with each situation as it comes. Each one's a little different based on 
the situation you're in. It's important to maintain professionalism, not get overly upset about these things. If you let each interaction get under your skin, you're never going to be in a good mood. Katie always adapts and comes up with engineering solutions to situations she faces. One of the ways she does this is by starting with her chair. So this chair is an old trusty chair. Uh, it is nine years old. So the funny story about this chair, this chair had malfunctioned several times and even broke my leg at one point. But I still love this chair more than any of my other chairs. <laughs> um, it's really cool. It goes up and down. So if I pull up to a lab table, for example, I can raise my chair up to sit at the lab table height. Um, I can go six miles per hour, which isn't as fast to keep up with all cool chemistry teachers. Um, I, can, <laughs> I can beat them in the long game. Yeah, so after I graduated college, I got a job. I moved on my own and moved to a new area and bought a house. I'm responsible for my yard care. I'm responsible for, you know, taking care of my house. I live in Michigan. There's snow. Um, I live a couple miles from the lake. The lake effect definitely does a number on us. I am not one that likes other people doing things for me. I like to do things for myself. I'm a little meticulous about my house care. I want my house to look a certain way. So I went on Amazon. I found a kind of push shovel with a wheelbase, and then I took it apart and changed some things out so that it could attach to my chair. And I just strapped the shovel onto my chair and go, and it works super well. Um, my chair has some nice horsepower. As long as there's not an icy layer, so it's really important I get out there and do that first shovel of the year to make sure we don't get that ice space forming. But otherwise, I can outplow my neighbors wow. with their power plows. As someone who lived in Michigan most of my life, I can tell you right now that shoveling snow is no small feat. As Katie explains, ice will form on your driveway even with just a small dusting of snow. At the beginning of snow season, you have that first snowfall that melts usually from a warm pavement or the sun, and then overnight it freezes, so you wake up to an ice rink in your driveway. So I play in a wheelchair floor hockey league. Um, I've played since I was in eighth grade. Um, I play in a league in Detroit. Um, I've been teaching wheelchair hockey clinics in St. Joseph, and then I also play on our stage travel team. So I'll go to tournaments and Philadelphia, Toronto, played in a tournament, a couple of tournaments in Detroit. I even played for Texas one year. I like to say I went pro. I had to sign a contract, so uh, yeah, I was basically pro. Sick. Hated giving up my college eligibility, but you know, sometimes you just can't turn down the offer on the table. Hockey is a great sport, and if you are hesitant but always wanted to play, I encourage you to give it a try. There are a lot of great beginning leagues, and you can connect with people like Katie who now teaches others how to play hockey, more specifically, wheelchair hockey. And sorry about the video quality on this last part. My camera died, but luckily I had a backup. I've been lucky enough to always have access to a wheelchair van, but not everyone does. Wheelchair vans can cost $75,000 on a $20,000 a year fixed income. That's just not a reality. So Disability Pride Month is every July. The Americans with Disabilities Act was signed on July 25th, 1990. That's right. That was like the first big law in the U.S. that gave people with disabilities rights. It was in 1990. Let that kind of sink in for a minute. It's 2023, 33 years ago, was the first time people actually had rights. Wow, I was already an adult, and it kind of makes me sad to think of the kids I grew up with that didn't have this act. We've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. You know, there were a few laws before that, but nothing as overarching as the ADA, which really said, hey, you guys have to put ramps on your building. And that's really where it started. Nothing else, just buildings have to be accessible. And so... Disability Pride Month is about helping people feel like, hey, we should be proud of who we are. We should keep working on, you know, celebrate the past. Having this is a big deal. We need to be grateful for that, but also remembering what can we do to make things better because there's still a long way to go. Disability Pride Month means to me, it's just a month to be happy about who we are, right? We 
are all different. One of my favorite stats is over 80% of people who don't die suddenly will have a disability at some point in their lives. We have a whole month to celebrate all of us that currently have a disability. And then I also like to take the opportunity to celebrate the people that will have a disability at some point and constantly remind them, <laughs> you'll be one of us one day. <laughs> uh, biggest piece of advice to tell people is to know their own value because if you're questioning your value if you're questioning your ability to do something you're never gonna be able to advocate for yourself as well but if you know your value if you understand what you need understand your limits and how to play to your strengths you're gonna set yourself up for success and you're gonna learn the skills you need to accommodate yourself not only in the classroom, but in the workforce when you get there as well. How can someone so young have such wisdom and great advice? The engineering profession is fortunate to have Katie and all her knowledge and experience. Bringing diversity to the field can only make it better. I'm very dedicated to the reason I went into engineering. I went in to help people with disabilities and until I'm in a role where that is my role, I'm still going to do everything I can outside of work. Um, I like to say that I have a day job <laughs> and then what I really love to do in the evenings, I float around in many Facebook groups and if people need help, I do what I can to help them. Friends reach out if they have students in their class that need accommodations or things to help their students succeed and I try and help them out. Anything I can do to make someone else's life a little easier, I try and do everything I can to do that. Thank you, Katie, for taking the time to share so much of your experience and happy Disability Pride Month.